I got it. Yeah, the book of Noah. <clears throat> the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. And uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's go ahead and read the first seven verses. By the way, um, just want to remind you, um, as I'm going, if you have any questions, feel free to just say, I've got a question about this. Don't worry about breaking my, my, uh, my rhythm, all right? This is why uh, hopefully Wednesday nights is a little bit more of an uh, intimate time. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together in the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. So tonight we're going to really discuss the idea of what do we do when we have a lost spouse? And I guess we can expand it a little bit, maybe lost relative. But if you look, if you remember what we've done in chapter 2, if, if you notice, what is the very first word in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1? What's the first word? Likewise, okay? So this is pointing back to chapter 2, that in the same way that... Um, uh, in the same way that we've been talking about in the previous chapter, we need to do it in this chapter. Well, what have we been talking about? How do we win the lost in a wicked culture? I mean, I know we can't relate to that. I know our culture is wonderful and they all love Jesus, right? Yeah. Um, how do we win the lost in our workplace? We also talked about that. How do we win the lost in our home? Here's the reality. Do you remember when Jesus says, I haven't come to bring peace, I'm bringing a sword. Have you ever had somebody angry with you because you were one of those Bible-believing Christians? You may not even be doing anything. But because you're one of those that believe that Jesus Christ is the only way, I'm going to tell you something. The gospel is offensive. Because it's offensive to the soul, to the spirit. Because what is necessary is when you are giving the gospel, the very first thing you're letting them know is, you are so bad, you're going to hell. Isn't that a fun thing to talk to somebody about? You are so bad that you've offended a holy God so much he can't even have you in his presence. Isn't that what we talk about in the gospel? Isn't that why people need to be born again? Because they need to have that relationship with God again? And in the home, especially in a Christian home, man, if you guys aren't connected spiritually, it is so hard. And I know we've got some wonderful people in this very church who, who have lost situations in their own home. 
And the gospel can separate, the gospel can cause tension because it's a spiritual battle. At least that's what the Bible says, right? We are constantly fighting a spiritual battle. You may not even want to be in the war, but you're in it. And so verses 1 through 7 is talking about how do we live in a household with the very people we love and want to spend the rest of our lives with do not know Christ? Well, you'll see in, in verse 1, it starts with, likewise, ye wives. Now, I need to say this categorically. This is not the passage where it's saying, woman, be in your place. Okay? I know sometimes, you know, people like, oh, can't stand the apostle Paul. He is such a misogynist. And, uh, but this isn't Paul. This is Peter. So you're just going to have to start hating everybody, I guess. But this is talking about wives. And by the way, wives, you get to cover verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Men, we only have verse 7. Now, why is it that the women have so many verses? Because they have to deal with men. And men are terrible. And men are horrible. I can speak from experience. I are one. Okay? <clears throat> And women, especially in the ancient times, they really were in a much harder situation. Let me explain. In the ancient world, as a woman, you could not change your religion. Your husband could remove you, throw you out on the streets. I know um, over in India, was I, I, was I in India 19, 2019? I met a woman. And you guys understand in India, they work on a caste system. The upper caste is the priestly caste. And it tends to be people with lighter skin. And then you go down, then you have the lower caste. They tend to be darker skin. And then you have the outcast or the pariah. Those are people that have stepped out of their caste, have done something wrong, and they are the lowest of the low. This woman was in the priestly caste, and she had heard the gospel, and she got saved. She was so excited, and she told her husband and her sons, I'm saved now. I've become a Christian. This is why, and gave them the gospel. The husband and the sons said, we will give you a full 24 hours to reject this nonsense. At the end of those 24 hours, she says, I belong to Christ. I, I can't reject that. And they kicked her out on the streets. There's no safety net. And now she's the lowest of the low. Now, God, God has taken care of her. It's, it's amazing. She ended up having a great women's ministry. But in the ancient world, that was the case. As a matter of fact, in some places, the husband might have right to do terrible things to the wife. A woman could not change her religion without the consent of her husband. Women in ancient times, were treated much like chattel, much like property. That is what Christianity changed, by the way. It always amazes me. The Apostle Paul gets so much flack for being a misogynistic jerk, okay? But here's the truth. He's the one that said there is no male, no female. He's the one that said that a woman can talk directly with God the same as a man. This was earth shattering. This was like crazy progressive leftist, you know, ideology. Okay. And it was Christianity that uh, 
that exposed that truth. Women were despised, hated, sometimes murdered by their husbands because of their conversion to Christianity. So when this starts off in 1 Peter chapter 3, likewise ye wives, there's so much uh, information here because there is so much danger. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection, right? Every guy says, yeah, be in subjection, yeah. Peter's like, I like this church already, man. This is, this is good preaching here. Yeah, you can stay on this for a long time. What does it mean, be in subjection here? Here's the basic truth. Your Christianity, your freedom in Christ does not allow you to shed the laws of society. Okay? You can't say, well, huh, I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. And since I'm driving such a long distance to witness to somebody, I have the right to go 120 in a 30. No, you don't. There is a God-given system for the family, and by the way, the husband is the head. He's, this is the way God made it. I was, I was asked today a question, and the question was, you know, we see homosexuality uh, in, in dogs and monkeys and things like that. Why does, why does God say it's unnatural? I said, well, let me, it's actually two steps here. Number one, it's unnatural because male dog, male dog, you don't get puppies. Male monkey, male monkey, you don't get baby monkeys. Male and male, you don't get babies. That's n nature. Said, but the bigger point is, if indeed there's a God, and if indeed he's everything that he says he is, then, then him talking about homosexuality is this, but his view on human sexuality is so much more narrow. You're just looking at this. God doesn't like heterosexual relationships outside of marriage. He's the one that gives the rule. He's the one that designed the family. So he's the one that says, all right, this is, this is what it is. And in any situation, in any time two people have a, uh, a different view on something, somebody has to be the head every single time. There's a, a church that I know. Um, they were trying to have a plurality of elders in their church instead of just a pastor. And I said, I said, here's the problem. When those two pastors have a disagreement, what do you do then? Well, you submit to each other, right. But they're going to be so passionate about it. Who gets the final word? Oh, I didn't think about that. God structured the husband in the family to be the head of the family. That's what he structured the family for. Now, <clears throat> I'm the head of my family, right? Right? And I, I do, everything that happens in our house is the way I want it, right? Do you notice the long pause here? Okay, why? Because you know and you know that though we're the head, man, she's got better ideas than me, right? She sees things that I can't possibly see. And sometimes when we converge and we have, it's going to be one way or the other, and we, we are a difference of opinion, I want you to know, <clears throat> I really consider what she's saying. Because she's right so often. Me having, me being the head is, is more of a, oh boy, <laughs> I've got to make that decision. And in the same way, my wife has got to say, all right, Lord, I'm... <laughs> I'm submitting to you, and because I'm submitting to you, you said to submit to, to my idiot, my husband, I'm going to submit to him, right? 
Now, look what it says. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Do you see that? Your freedom in Christ doesn't allow rebellion. It just doesn't. And it says to be in subjection, which is the opposite of rebellion, to your own husbands. God nowhere in the Bible says females are subservient to men. Nowhere in the Bible. Amen? Amen. And the real reason, and I want you to think, I've been in churches long enough to know this. Sometimes when you have a saved wife and a lost husband or a low spiritual minded husband, the wife will sometimes look at the congregation and go, man, I wish my husband was more like him. Sometimes husbands can say, man, I wish, I wish uh, uh, my wife was more like her. There was, a, uh, there was a, a woman at our church where we got saved at, not saved at, where we got married at. Her name was Ginger Smith. Man, Ginger could just do everything. She really could. But I know. I will never compare her to Ginger. This is my wife. This is my wife. But other people were tempted. I, one guy was stupid enough to go, you know, you really should learn from Ginger. It's like, oh, oh, man, you're dumb. Okay. But there is a, you, it's important that we do not compare our spouses with other people. It's wrong. It's not Christ. Because your spouse is your spouse. Amen? Now it says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if they obey not the word, if they obey not the word, if the husband does not obey the if your husband's lost, that's the point here. They also may without the word be done, uh, be won by the conversation of the wives. Okay. So they do not obey the word. They're lost. So how do they get saved? You, uh, you find his favorite book and you throw a few tracks in there. Or uh, you stick um, scripture on, uh, on a toothbrush and you wind it up. Or um, for Christmas, you buy him a Christian shirt. You get him Christian books. It is a very rare thing that a spouse responds, a lost spouse responds well to these. It's telling the saved spouse, don't start berating them with the Bible. Don't start saying, look, This is the, you better start believing this. Though we want to say that at times. Sometimes out of frustration, sometimes out of pure love. Because we want their eternity to be right. And it's hard because you don't want to also hide your Christianity. So what do you do? It says... If they obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. What is your conversation? It's not what comes between your lips. Conversation, biblically, is your life. Your lost spouse, your lost loved one, you are the Bible that they see. And you, the, your Christianity in your life is the only thing that they need to see. Give them a reason of the hope that lies within you. Verse 2, while they behold your chaste conversation, your chaste life coupled with fear, let them see you with a holy life. By the way, this chaste, The idea of chaste here, it has the idea of sexuality. It is is admonishing the spouse 
Don't get uh, emotionally attached to anyone else that might fit your spiritual need. Don't do that. Don't even walk there. You and your husband, you are bound together. Let your husband see the respect that you have for him, not because he's all that, because Christ is all that. Verse 3, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of the plating of hair and wearing of gold and of putting on apparel. All right, first of all, I promise you the Bible is not against a woman putting on apparel. This is necessary to walk around, right? Can we agree with this? Okay, I've heard preachers say, see, you can't do this. This is telling women don't do this. I'm like, yeah, but it says putting on apparel. You've got to wear apparel. So what is it saying? Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of the plating of hair. So women, just let your hair look like a rat's nest. And a wearing of gold. No more jewelry. Not even a wedding band, because that's gold. Right? This is not a verse about dressing up for church. This verse is in even covering how to dress in church. What is it covering? Remember, by your conversation, they can be one. With your chase conversation, they can be one. He's saying, don't let these outward bits be, the, be who you are. It's the inward that he has to see. This is a verse reminding a wife of what is important and what isn't. Can we be honest here for a second? After a couple is married for a long time, the appearance of the spouse isn't as important as it once was. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't even think I'd even start dating my wife if she wasn't pretty. And she's pretty. I like her. Okay? I really do. Really pretty. I'll tell you some old pictures of her. And every once in a while, my wife goes, oh, I'm going gray. Like, I like it. It's cool. Oh, gravity's taking effect in some of my life. It's okay. Everything's good. Oh, I've got a weird hair growing out in the middle of my forehead. It's all right. She doesn't have a weird hair growing out in the middle of my forehead, by the way. <laughs> the longer you're married, the longer it's what's inside the, the inner for each other, that's what counts. And this is a simple admonition at that point. Just like you do, continue to dress nice, dear. Just like you do, make sure your hair is nice, honey. Just like you do, make sure you're presentable, but make sure it's your inward qualities. Those are the ones that really need to shine. Those are the qualities, verse three, it's, it's, not, it's not saying you can't plait your hair. It's not saying you can't wear gold. It's not saying you can't wear nice clothes. Please do all of those things. But it's saying those are not what's going to win your husband. What's going to win your husband is the inside. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of a great price. <clears throat> Ladies, your greatest quality is not your new hairdo. Now, I'm going to kind of go off track here. Ladies, let me admonish you. When you get something done, don't go, hey, honey, can you see what's new on me? Don't do that. It's the most terrifying thing that can ever be said because if we get it wrong, everything's just terrible. It just goes, it, there is no good way. And if you know most guys, we're not very observant, okay? Um, I, I think I won points today. My wife is wearing a different outfit. And I go, ooh, I don't think I've seen that before. She's like, no, I'm changing it up today. But, you know, on, on, on most times, you know, what color is your wife's eyes? Does she have eyes? I don't even know. Okay. You know, <clears throat> it's the inner. 
This is what we need to worry about. Your greatest asset is not a new dress. It's the quality of a spirit that will speak louder than any words. And God here, again, let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. Your Christian life is not corruptible. It's the ornament, just like gold rings, a necklace, a hairdo. Your Christian spirit, that's the ornament. It's the ornament of a quiet and meek spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. God sees your character as your greatest apparel, as your greatest asset. And by the way, I, as, as a guy, I've kind of noticed this. The greater a woman's uh, inner beauty seems to make the outward beauty just shine better. I've only noticed that with you, though. Here, Okay, just verse 5. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, I know what some of you ladies are thinking. I could act like Sarah if I just had a man like Abraham. Oh, please know that this is not trying to compliment Abraham at all. I want you to think in Sarah's life, that we see in the Bible, when did Sarah submit to her husband? This is where you speak to me. When? When he lies to the Egyptians. And what happens to Sarah? She gets taken for what? To go to Disneyland? To be wedded to another man. God is not saying this is okay. God is not. He's just saying, look, ladies, God understands a tough situation. And how was Sarah rewarded by God for keeping her mouth shut? Seriously. Well, let's think about before that. Let's talk about like immediately. He protected her. He protected her. And what her ultimate wish was, by the way, her ultimate wish, I think was twofold. It was a son. But it's also a husband that would protect her and be good and be the type of godly husband she really wanted. See, after the manner, for after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves inside being in subjection to their own husbands. This is the way godly women in the Old Testament acted. They trusted God, not their situation. Very important. Many times with a lost spouse, a lost loved one, things look hopeless. And this is where you have to say, God, if you don't do something, it's all going to fall apart. And that's their trusting. They showed this by their humility to their own husbands who were dead wrong. I can think of even Abigail. Man, her husband, David was going to... She's like, man, yeah, my husband, not the smartest guy in the world. I'm sorry. Please don't keep it. Keep him alive, please. And, and she, you know, she didn't go, whew, David, I've been praying for this for a long time. Can you take care of this situation, please? She didn't do that because she wanted her husband to change. She trusted the Lord. There's, there's, some, there's some bad situations. And, and the point is, is that these women in the first century, they were facing some really rough situations. And he said, look, have a godly, conversation. Have a godly life. Don't, don't 
be rebellious to God's plan for the family, trust God. Now, by the way, does this mean in every situation the husband got saved? No. But this was the best opportunity for the husbands to get saved. Verse 6, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I, by the way, Peter, this is a good time to say, <clears throat> honey, Sarah called Abraham Lord. It's time to step up your game. I tried to do that with my wife. She says, here, Lord, take out the trash. Okay, so that didn't work. Now, when I got ordained, I, I wouldn't answer to anything but Reverend for the first 24 hours. She humored me on that day. But Sarah, Sarah did this even though Abraham was an absolute idiot. And just like we need to follow the pattern of Abraham's faith, right? Right? We, we learned that. We've, we've talked about Abraham's faith, and we need to follow his pattern of faith. He wasn't perfect. But we need to follow his pattern of faith. Women need to follow the pattern of Sarah's humility. Do well, don't let the situation frighten you, and it's tough. Now, verse 7. Likewise, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Okay. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together in the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. By the way, that last bit of that verse, that your prayers be not hindered, is sobering. But let's start with that word likewise. Why is that word likewise there? In the same way as the wives, husbands need to let their lives speak out their Christianity. And this is the hardest thing. When, when two people are married or when, when there's a relationship, when there's a family dynamic, your life needs to show who Christ is. Verse 2, excuse me, uh, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. Dwell with them according to knowledge. I'm, I'm going to, uh, we, we, we use the King James Version here, but I'm now going to translate this into the Pickett Version. Uh, dwell with them according to knowledge. Live in a way that tries to understand them. Now, that may seem like an impossible idea to try to understand a wife. And many times I try. And it's, 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 look, women are mysterious. They are. And they'll keep it that way. They'll shake things up. This, ladies, you don't need to listen. I'm trying to help my fellow guys here, okay? But what does it mean to live in a way that tries to understand them? Cherish her. Cherish her. I think one time you said to me, in our relationship, you enjoy feeling cherished. Try to meet her emotional needs. It's hard. It's not easy. But live in a way that tries to meet her emotional needs. Meet her physical needs. This is what a husband is supposed to do. This is what a godly husband is supposed to do. Whether your spouse is, uh, is doing what's right or not, this is what a husband is supposed to do. The idea of dwell with them according to knowledge, you need to look at the relationship logically and not let hot emotion override the quest for your loved one's soul. Ladies, what's more important, your husband's soul or the socks that keep on landing two feet away from the clothes hamper? What's more important? You can't look at her. You're saved, right? So you, you have no excuse, all right? <laughs> right? The soul's more important. Ladies, uh, men, what's more important? You know, that your eggs are cooked right or her soul? 
mean, and I, I get it. When things are done a certain way and or it's not done a certain way, there can be an irritant, can't there? God's recognizing this. And this is the reason why he next says in verse, uh, continues in verse 7, Dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, in a relationship, in a marriage relationship, who needs to submit? Tell me. Who needs to submit? Everybody, one time. Submit yourselves one to another. Isn't that somewhere in the Bible? In a marriage relationship, who needs to submit? Both. Now, that doesn't remove the husband as the head, correct? But this is what the difference between submission and a dictatorship is. Amen? One of the br most brilliant statements I ever made is I decided I was going to help my wife. And I said, look, God has made me the head of this house and I'm the Lord of this home and you're going to do what I say. Oh boy. That made things just so much smoother. I was an idiot. Wasn't I, honey? <laughs> See, don't you like it? She's just very stoic right there. No, both people in a relationship needs to submit. And neither person is inherently less in a marriage relationship. Amen? In the same way, if you will, both spouses are weak. But the wife's situation, because if the husband's the head of head, then the wife's very situation makes her more dependent on the husband. And husbands, we need to recognize that. I read today, uh, no, not today, Monday. Weakness itself, by the very term weakness, has a claim upon the strong for defense and deference. Men, we need to make sure that as heads of the home, we defend and we give deference. We honor her as the weaker vessel. Now, there's many situations that women can do much better than men. I can beat her in an arm wrestling match, though. I'm pretty sure of it. Okay? And this is not, not changing roles. It's just identifying why did God create Eve? Help. And what does that word meet mean? The word meet means appropriate. Being a help appropriate to what Adam needs. Adam needed a wife. If you will, he wasn't complete until he had Eve. And indeed, a husband and wife bring different strengths. You'll see it. If, if let's say, Natalio, you and Mel took little Reuben and you guys were in a pool together, if Mel has the baby, she's going to be hugging the baby so close. And little baby, look, look in the feet. Now, when you get the baby, you're going to get the baby and go, yeah, throw out the baby, let the baby dunk a little bit. Yeah, that's going to make you a man, buddy. All right? Right? Yes. That's the reason why his kids are the way they are. It's not their fault. But the child needs that mother's love. The dad gives a child love too, but not like a mom. But the child also needs the adventure. The go climb a tree and break your arm. Get out of the house. They, they need that. And so even though... God has ordained one as the head of the relationship. Please understand, 
but both of them are weak. <laughs> and But they have different strengths that complement each other. Now, verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Share with your unbelieving wife and maybe even your unbelieving husband or your unbelieving spouse, everything that a marriage should be. Just because they're married to a Christian doesn't mean their life is now going to be miserable until they become a Christian. And by the way, uh, this is going out to, I, I got lots of people that watch this, so please don't think, oh, he's talking to Dakota or anything like that, all right? Don't think that. Now, in verse 7, it says, do this, why? As being heirs together in the grace of life. What does that mean? What does it mean to be heirs together in the grace of life? Isn't that a beautiful description of what marriage is? It's the grace of life, not the grace of the afterlife, not the grace of heaven, but the grace of life. And it does not describe what a marriage needs to be seasoned with, grace. Living with other humans can be tough, can it, Dakota? Yes. You know, I just want to sleep in till 2 o'clock in the morning. Why don't you? <laughs> 2 o'clock in the afternoon or whenever. Why, why must you come in and say you love? Get away if you really love me. You know, it's like Sleeping Beauty. If Prince Charming really loved her, let her sleep. But a husband and wife are heirs together in the grace of life. That's what a marriage should be. Now, it ends up saying men do this. So what? So your prayers are not hindered. Well, and by the way, I think this also... Um, could go to the wife also. But what is the prayer that we're talking about here? What is the heart's desire that the saved spouse wants? What is their desire? I'll wait. For the salvation of the unsaved. Right? That's it. That is the desire. Do this so that these prayers are not hindered. And like, like I was saying, this, this, can be, this can be so much more than just a spouse. You know, how many of you, when you first got saved, were really excited about being saved? And everybody else was like, ah, oh, get away from me. They're still that way with you today, Natalia. Right? I mean, you just, you're so excited. You're just, you're just so excited. You have so much power in your testimony, in your life, that even if they were never able to pick up a Bible, they should be able to at least know Christianity is true and something that they want in their life because they see your life. And so this is how we survive a marriage or a family relationship where we so desperately want the other person to be saved. Now, maybe you're watching this, or maybe you're here and saying, nah, I haven't all done that right. You know, I got John 3.16 spray painted, you know, my husband's, you know, uh, office, just so that he'd know that I love him for all of eternity. What do I do? Just start going straight. You know, the scripture says, let him that stole do what? Still don't work. Just stop. Just stop and start doing what's right. And watch what God does. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the beautiful opportunity of being your ambassadors. Lord, allow us.